Hey, welcome back. So I went on the internet, as one does, and I figured that there are about 755 videos on tramming the head of a milling machine square to the table. And then it dawned on me that I haven't done a video on this topic myself. So I figured that's a great loss for <laughs> For everyone if I don't do one and here we are the the background to this is I picked up a technique from Adam the machinist which he posted about half a century ago on Instagram and this technique resonated very well with me and I used it since then and it works in many cases better than just sweeping the table on a full circle with an indicator to tram the head because in many cases we have stuff set up on the table and we can't swing an indicator there. I borrowed some of the craft supplies from Adam the Machinist and I'm using them to visualize the technique we're about to do or the three techniques that I want to talk about. So I have our milling head which can be rotated and we have in this case a rigid mill table uh, this could also be a bridge port where the table moves side to side and up and down. It's pretty much the same if the head moves up and down. So, like this. So, let's say you have your head out of tram like, like this. Normally you would take a dial test indicator. Well, that's a little bit extreme. You indicate on one side, you swing it over, you indicate on this side, and then you adjust the head and you repeat this until you get a zero reading over here. And a zero reading over here. Super standard practice. Some people put something like a, a brake rotor on the table to give a nice flat surface to indicate. Some people use a large bearing race on the table to indicate on. I don't like that too much. I prefer... Uh, the, the idea and, and the technique is good with the brake rotor and, or the bearing race since you don't bump the indicators through the T-slots of the table. Personally, I prefer to use a gauge block. Indicate on the gauge block. Swing the indicator around 180 degrees and move the gauge block over here. That way I don't have to put a, a brake rotor, which I don't own anyways, on the table nor do I bump the indicator stylus through all the T-slots when I do my full rotation. So that's one technique. Then a very common technique, at least on the decal machines, that's very common. I'm not entirely sure how well that works on a bridge port, for example. You extend the quill out all the way, then you put an indicator on the table. In this case, we have to move the head, the table down a little bit or the head up. So you have your indicator here on the table and you just traverse the table with the indicator up and down and indicate against the quill. And you bump the head until you get on your on your up and down motion, zero to zero, top to bottom. So that's a very good technique. On the decal machines, you usually have about 50, 60 millimeter long quill to indicate on. So in reality, since the indicator stylus has a diameter too, you have maybe 55 to 50 millimeters of travel to indicate on. It's not that accurate. It's for general purpose shop use, it's fine, but for high precision work, it's not ideal. So, and what's the other technique now? You can, you put your indicator in the spindle again. 
you put a cage block on the table somewhere. Doesn't need to be on the table. It can be on the face of an of a dial uh, of an indexing head, for example, too. And you move the table over. You indicate on here. You don't touch the indicator or the C height adjustment. You swing the indicator around 180 degrees, and you move the table over and indicate again on the gauge block. And you do that too until your indicator shows from side to side a zero to zero reading. So we start over here at zero, then we move the table with the gauge block untouched over, and we swing the indicator over. And we get our zero, zero reading side to side, and we're good. What happens in my shop very often is I, ha I don't have a table on the milling machine at all, or I have an indexing head set up on the table. And I don't want to clear the table of the milling machine. Then this technique is really, really useful. Because that way I can indicate on a very large diameter without having to mess with my setup. I, I take an arbitrary point on somewhere, for example, on the face of one of the jaws of the chuck. Or I put a gauge block on the face of the chuck itself between the jaws, like this. Then I move it over, indicate on the gauge block, zero out my dial, do whatever is needed. Swing the indicator around, like this. Move my table over, indicate on this side, and that way I can tram my head of the mill very precisely on a very large radius without much effort or without much setup effort. So I hope this little demonstration was kind of helpful. Let's go to the machine. You have your universal tool room milling machine, your bridge port, your Decal FP, your Cincinnati Toolmaster, whatever. You got it all out of tram because you had a fancy setup and now you want to get the head back in tram. And there are several ways to do it. The, the very traditional way or very common way to do this is to put an indicator in here on an arm and sweep the table. But sometimes we have something set up on the machine that doesn't allow to sweep the table because, well, in my case, there isn't a table. I have a Weiss on an indexing head currently. Well, not currently. That's my setup most of the time on this machine, it seems at least at the moment, because that's very much fitting the parts I'm making at the moment. But there's another way that I wanted to show you. I didn't invent this, I saw this, I learned this from Adam the Machinist on, on Instagram. And let's do this because I want to get the head back square. And on these machines we have a really nice graduated large dial, an engraved dial, not a bolted on one. And if you get these lines lined up very very closely, you're pretty much there already within very tight tolerance. Then I'm just finger tightening one or two of the screws just with the Allen key between my fingers. So I still can bump the head around by, by slightly using the palm of my hand against the casting. And I line these lines up as good as possible and then we go to tramming. So one of the methods that I mentioned is to extend the quill out as far as possible. Take an indicator stand, put it somewhere stable, for example here on the vise. Find the high spot on the quill by moving in the y direction. There you go. And we can move the, the indicator to a convenient position. Like I'm starting here at 20 and we just rapid traverse up and down. And would you believe it? Apart from the initial bump which moved something around a little bit, um, when I move up and down, 
the needle doesn't move over over the short distance of the quill that we can indicate. Uh, that's as good as the dial on these heads is. <laughs> it's really darn good. If you if you can line them up with um, with magnification, like uh, like what I like to use is a a loop. You you can get very very close. So for most work, I would call this more than good enough. But uh, let's see. I think this is a distance of about well 50 to 60 millimeters that we just indicated on. For high precision work I would call that a little bit on the low side so normally now you would sweep the table with an indicator but as I said I don't have a table on this machine currently I'm not going to set one up. There is a different way of doing it. Get the quill back in and for that we need an indicator that can be mounted in a spindle for example on my nifty uh, indicator arm here. Take a collet or a grill chuck or whatever you have and put it in here. Lock it and put it out to, to a nice large, let's say we put it out this far. And we put a gauge block here and we mark the position of the gauge block. Well, we don't have to. But might be helpful. So obviously we can't sweep the table. We could sweep the top of the vise, which is a little bit wider than the length of the quill that we just indicated on. Vice in my case is uh, almost yeah, it's 90 millimeters so we could uh, sweep this with the indicator it's also not perfect it's it's not the largest of surfaces here so what we can do is we can zero out the indicator and we spin it to, to be roughly in line with the x-axis and we get our indicator to a convenient number not preloading it too much we preload it, for example, to 30, or let's move it, let's zero it out, just for convenience, it's easier for video. Then we swing the, the spindle around 180 degrees to be in, ax, in axis with the x axis again. And then we just move the table over. And this will give us the second point for indicating the tram of the spindle. This is a little bit more hand cranking. You could power feed it too, but usually after one or two passes, you're good. We are 0 0.14 millimeters off tram. The, the indicator is preloaded more, so the spindle is tilted to the left. I'm just going to bump the, the casting to half of that, which would be seven. Zero out the, the dial, swing it around once again, and move the table back. Okay, so we're already within 10 microns after one pass. Well, that's the second pass now. We could bump it closer to that, but that's uh, a radius of 90, a diameter of 180 millimeters that we sweeped and we're within 10 microns. We could try to bump it a little bit, just like this. Zero it out again and do one last pass.
So we swing the axis around the, the spindle around and crank it back. And well, that's zero. So this took really not very long to get the spindle on this machine squared up pretty nicely. I'm tightening the bolts of the head now and I'm watching the indicator for movement. But since I already had, had them snuck down, uh, there shouldn't be much movement. Having used Deckel FP milling machines for years and years now, I have to say that they are particularly easy to tram on the head because the head is very compact and not top heavy. Center of mass of these heads is pretty much in their center. Not like I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how well or how good a Bridgeport milling machine is to tram. I never used one, but the head looks very top heavy. Maybe if you I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not <laughs> not pretending to know anything about the Bridgeport mills. Uh, I think they have a warm drive to move the the head tilt. Maybe that helps if you had the screws tightened down a little bit. But in general, I have to say I, I prefer this method over directly sweeping the table because it also takes into consideration the table wear. If the table is dished or something like that, that that's in my mind a good way to tram the mill head. For general purpose, tramming, I'm just indicating on the quill if the machine has a good moving C-axis. On my, on my RF45 optimum milling machine, that didn't work. The head doesn't move smooth enough to indicate on the quill. It's a little bit too jumpy and the head tends to nod forward on the weight. And that gives you a... that will give a problem with the reading too. On, on the on benchtop milling machines, this method or directly sweeping the table is preferable. On a tool room machine, indicating on a quill usually works perfectly fine. Quick bonus trick for tramming the spindle of a machine out of square. In this example, it's my surface grinder with the tilting head, but this works also on a milling machine. If you want to knot or tilt the head to a certain angle, very precisely. Um, you can put a sign bar on the table, which is set to your desired angle, or you use a very precise uh, protractor, and then you sweep, you sweep the surface of the sign bar or sign plate with a dial test indicator mounted to the spindle like this. And then you bump your spindle head of the machine around until you get a zero zero reading on both sides. That's a very old school but very precise way of setting a machine head to a certain angle. I, I like this method quite well and it works, it works mar marvelous. So we start down here with a zero reading on the sign bar, then we swing over 180 degrees to the top. Ugh. And I get a, a 10 micron reading here on the, on the top of the sign bar. So that's a very good trick. Works really, really well. I hope this demonstration made sense. Thanks to Adam the Machinist for teaching me this technique years and years ago. And also thanks for borrowing me your craft supplies. <laughs> Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.